right is George Packer. Uh, he's, he's a writer at the, at the Atlantic, and one of his books, uh, one of my favorite books, actually, uh, won the National Book Award. Uh, it was the, the Unwinding and Inner History of New America. But his most recent book um, is Last Best Hope, America in Crisis, and renewal, which I always think is <laughs> the last bit. You, know, you need that last bit too, you know. Uh, um, and he's, he's very interesting, though, about his own writing. So I'm going to read you a quote, because um, this is what he says about himself. It's fascinating. He says, it's, it's absurd to approach this war from a position of neutrality. As a journalistic stance, neutrality is worthless and usually spurious because everyone is a partisan of some kind. Objectivity is different, the necessary effort always doomed to fall short of rendering reality exactly like a carpenter striving for plumb, level and square. No, what's most crucial is independence, refusing to surrender your judgment of the truth for the sake of a political cause. Indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, George Packer. I, I'm not going to talk about Ukraine tonight. Um, I'm not going to talk about anything I'm working on now. In fact, I'm going to skip way back to behind all of the books I've written to when I was 23 years old and tell a story about that. But it is, I was just thinking a minute ago, kind of the story of how I became a writer. I, after college, I went into the Peace Corps and uh, found myself in a little village in the country of Togo in West Africa. I was an English teacher, of course, because I had no skills. <clears throat> and. All my life I had been a very good student and that had pretty much been what I'd done. And as soon as I arrived in Togo, I found that strange things were happening to me. My pulse kept speeding up without any reason, just sudden racing of the pulse so that I began to actually check my pulse and I, it became a habit. I would check my pulse endless times every day to see how I was doing. Was it speeding up or was it staying at a good rate? Sometimes it would speed up and I had no idea why. I'd get dizzy. I didn't know why I was getting dizzy, but I got dizzy. I never associated this at the time, only years later, with the fact that I was taking weekly anti-malarial drugs um, <laughs> called chloroquine, which is quite uh, psychotropic. And I certainly didn't associate it with the big event of my childhood, which was the suicide of my father uh, when I was 12, after he had been paralyzed and in a wheel wheelchair for three and a half years. Instead, I associated it with being in Togo. I thought, I'm in Togo, and suddenly my pulse is racing. Why? And I began to develop strange symptoms, like I suddenly was convinced I had muscular dystrophy because my right pinky began to quiver. Um, or testicular cancer was a close call at one point. Um, all kinds of near misses with serious diseases kept coming my way. And of course the irony was all around me was malaria, was tuberculosis, typhoid, cholera, amoebic dysentery, uh, hepatitis, serious diseases that every now and then would simply take away someone in the village. They'd be gone. I would ask, what, how did they die? And I'd be told, no one knows, death. It was a natural thing. And it happened all the time. It happened to children, it happened to adults, it happened to old people. And I became convinced that it was gonna happen to me. So I brought a lot of books with me because as I said, what I'd been all my life was a student. And those books were books that Roosevelt would have approved of. Um, books by Kierkegaard and Thomas Mann and Conrad and Jung. And these were books that I looked to for explanations of what was happening to me. Why was my body running away with me? 
why did I suddenly want to just fall asleep? So I read The Sickness Unto Death by Kierkegaard, and it didn't help. <laughs> and I read The Heart of Darkness by Conrad, and it didn't help. I read about the shadow in Jung, and I knew I had a shadow at this point. It followed me everywhere. It didn't help. The shadow didn't go away. It just stayed there. So this was month after month in this village of racing pulse and a feeling that life had completely lost its significance. I would hear the rooster in the morning next door and the rooster would be telling me life means nothing, your life means nothing. A sense of utter meaninglessness had settled over me and I was also reading Moby Dick and there's a page in Moby Dick that talks about the palsied world becomes a leper. And I thought, exactly, the palsied world is a leper. All of this was new and terrible to me. And I kept looking in literature for answers that literature could not provide. So one night, I suddenly became convinced that I was going to have a stroke, of course. My father had had a stroke. That was the big event of my childhood. I wasn't thinking about him, though. I was thinking about the fact that I felt a little lump in my neck that might have been a blood clot in the carotid artery, who knows? And I began reading a book called Where There Is No Doctor that the Peace Corps had given us. It's about that thick. What do you do if you have a stroke? What do you do if you have meningitis? You fucking find a doctor is what the answer was in every case. There was no doctor anywhere close. My pulse started racing. There was no doctor, and I was about to have a stroke. So I went next door. I was living with a Togolese family, and I'd gotten very close to them, especially to the mother of the eight children, Christine. And I said, Christine, where's Benjamin, her husband, who was an, a guy who was never around? He was a taxi driver. He had a car. She said, he's out. I said, when he gets back, tell me, because I need him to take me to the hospital. And she said, what's wrong? And I said, he just needs to take me to the hospital. And um, an hour later, he hadn't come back. I said, Christine, Benjamin will not be back tonight. We have to find someone. So we went next door to the neighbor whose cousin had a car. The cousin was finishing his dinner. And I said, you've got to take me to the hospital in your car. And he said, let me finish my dinner. I said, no, now. Because I suddenly became aware of this time bomb that was ticking in my head. It was going to go off. And who knows when, but maybe a minute from now and we didn't have time to wait for him to finish his dinner. He was very annoyed with this, but he also knew I was gonna pay him. So he got in his car and we went out of the village toward the local town where there was a hospital. And Christine, the mother of the children next door, went with me and she held my hand the entire way. And I'll never forget that Christine held my hand and kept saying, ça va passer, ça va passer. It's going to go away, it's going to pass. And that was pretty much all that got me to the hospital because the time bomb was ticking really loud. We got to the hospital in 17 minutes. The driver showed me his watch. He was quite proud of that. We got out and Christine, at this point I felt like I needed her to support me. She walked me up the stairs and we were met by an orderly who said, no, 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 no. If you're not a registered patient, you can't come in here. You have to go back downstairs. And I thought, the time bomb's going to go off because of Togolese bureaucracy. I'm not going to make it. This was a pretty good hospital in a totally empty area, dark. There, were, there was no one around. There were no lights on. And we were at the foot of a mountain. And finally, a nurse came and said, come upstairs. And she brought me upstairs and said, what seems to be the problem? And I said, do you know cerebral hemorrhage? And what? Cere we're speaking French at this point. Cerebral hemorrhage. Oh, yeah, cerebral, yeah, yeah I, I, know, I know, cerebral hemorrhage, and continue to take me upstairs. And I realized she doesn't have any idea what I'm talking about. She doesn't understand. I'm about to have a stroke. And I was sat down and asked a series of questions. Do you have, sh do you have chills? I said, no, I don't have chills. I knew why they asked that, because that would mean I had malaria. I knew I didn't have malaria. I'd had malaria before. They wrote down chills anyway. 
And finally, I was put on a, a table in a, a room and lay there waiting for the doctor. And I became aware of noise at the table next to me. And I looked, and there was a Togolese woman, an elderly woman, who had drool coming out of her mouth and was moaning. And I knew, as sure as I knew anything, that she was dying. And I had a quiver of shame. She's dying, and I'm only thinking about my stroke that I'm about to have. Maybe it, it could be worse. But when you're in that state of mind where you're convinced you're about to die, it's not enough to realize someone else is suffering because you can't stop thinking about your own suffering. So I knew a woman was dying next to me, and I made myself watch her to understand this is what it looks like to die, but I couldn't get over the feeling that I was about to die. And suddenly a doctor walked into the room. He was white, and that was the very noticeable thing about him. He had blue eyes and a brown beard and spoke English with a German accent. And I suddenly felt with the racism that is in every white person in Africa, maybe I'm not gonna die. And he said, what seems to be the problem? And I said, I think I'm about to have a stroke, doctor. And he said, a stroke? Aren't you a bit young for a stroke? I began to describe the symptoms, the racing pulse, the lump on my neck. He said, come, these are very subjective reactions. And I was given a shot of Valium and chloroquine. I didn't want the chloroquine, but I had no choice because it came with the Valium. <laughs> and I fell into the deepest sleep of my life and woke up the next morning and found that I was in a beautiful place surrounded by tropical trees and there was a kind of fragrance in the air after the rain. It was the rainy season. It's, everything smelled beautiful. And I went for a walk and when I came back, I ran into the doctor. Dr. Jacoby was his name. And he said, how are you feeling? I said, Actually, I'm feeling a lot better, doctor, thank you. And he said, you see, very subjective reactions. And I, he handed me a little booklet that was my discharge booklet, and it said on the front, beginning nervous breakdown. <laughs> and I looked at it with a kind of shock and recognition at the same time, yes. And I felt that shame I'd felt the night before with the dying woman come back. And I said to him, um, this must be unusual. He said, no, no. The German volunteers come in here all the time with these symptoms that they do not understand, but they are the beginning of breakdown. And I, he said, do you have no one you can talk to? And I mentioned Christine, who had been with me the night before, who had, I felt, kept me alive. And he said, ah, no, you cannot share your intimate problems with the African family. You need to go to the capital, have a drink in a nice hotel sometime. And I said, I guess not too many Togolese come in here with the same problem. He said, oh, all the time. Teachers, students who failed their exams, they come in here with the symptoms of Stroke, but they are the beginning of breakdown. This was an utter revelation to me. And I said, so only educated people? He said, of course. Never the peasants. They had not yet had their lives torn in two. Thank you.